Need Bitcoin support? The pros at CoinBeast Connect are here to help. Learn about self-custody, privacy, mining, lightning payments, and much more. Simply go to coinbeast.com backslash connect and schedule a one-on-one video call with a Bitcoin pro. Take your knowledge to the next level by connecting with a pro on coinbeast.com today. Please check out episode 41 with Adam O, aka Denver Bitcoin on Twitter, episode 46 with Hoddle Tarantula, or episode 49 with Adam Meister. All our pros you can connect with at coinbeast.com connect today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. My name is Chris Alamo, and I am an amateur investor. This podcast is my open source journal of everything I learn about investing and wealth management. I'm here to explore the key concepts, market dynamics, and investing strategies that will assist you on the path towards financial independence and financial literacy. My mission is to build us from amateurs to experts. All suggestions are my own, and I recommend that you should do your own research before taking any investment advice. See you in this week's episode. I hope you enjoy all right, we're back to it. Welcome everyone back. This is episode 52. I have Colin Overway here. Uh, so from advisewealth.com. So Colin Overway is a certified financial planner and founder of the fee-only financial planning firm, Advise Wealth Management. In 2021, he was named investor top 100 advisor in the country and was the youngest firm owner on that list. He serves as a board, uh, serves on the board for Michigan's Financial Planning Association chapter, He's been a regular guest speaker at multiple university wealth management programs, such as Michigan uh, State University. He's been cited in multiple publications, such as Barron's, Market Watch, and Investor, Investors Business Daily. And he's an inspiring golf bum that lives out in LA. Colin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for adding that last little bit in there. Aspiring golf bomb is very important here. <laughs> I picked up golf during the pandemic and it's a sport that I always said that I would hate and never do. And I love being out in nature and hiking and stuff. So I don't know why I wouldn't like golf, but picked it up. I absolutely love it. By no means am I good. good. I'm trying to break a hundred still, but I really enjoy the sport. It's fun to go out with your, your friends and play. Exactly. And it's something we can do for the long term too. So we can be those old guys out there. You got a long time horizon here. Yeah, you, it's funny you should say that. I was playing with a bunch of guys that were like in their mid seventies and they can't, they're like, we can't hit it far, but they hit it just accurate as hell. So I've just like got to take lessons from them. They're like, they know every shot, they know their club. So <laughs> definitely gives me appreciation for the long game for sure. So yep. Colin, so it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, I kind of found you on TikTok, and I think, uh, yeah. you know, it's kind of cool. Like I'm tr- obviously trying to go out onto Twitter you know, Instagram, YouTube, you name it, any of the platforms I'm trying to use any and all of them. But I just, uh, we kind of were talking before we started recording and uh, you're kind of one of the content that I really enjoy and appreciate compared to a lot of the people that we were saying before, not to name names or criticize people, but a lot of times they like to sell you the pipe dream about this random cryptocurrency going to a million dollars or this random stock, you know, gonna 4X tomorrow or, you know, taking out crazy options trades. I, I know that's normally not your forte and that's also not what I pre- preach and, uh, you know, like to practice what I preach. So what are your thoughts on that? That's, yeah, I know it's awesome that we got connected there and we were just talking before the show how it's almost like financial pornography, right? It's like just not real. Um, you go out and, and try to get rich quick and there's everyone and their brother has this course to sell you on TikTok. And I originally got on the platform because I, it was just something new and kind of fun. And I've always liked creating video content. And it started to actually become kind of like this uh, nice, easy place for me to go and create new stuff and then maybe just repurpose it or use that as ideas for platforms that maybe are my clientele exist, like Facebook or LinkedIn, a little bit more traditional. And I just started finding people out there doing real financial advice and giving real business advice and you being one of them. And we're starting to like create our own posse here. And I think it's starting to catch on. It's almost kind of like this TikTok. 2.0 version that's not just uh, uh, you know girls dancing or just like people selling uh, Bitcoin dreams. So uh, it's fun to to get connected with real professionals out there and people giving good advice. Yeah, I completely agree. So I'm the oldest of four. So my younger sister is 16. So um, she obviously has been on the TikTok app, and it's it's funny, exactly what like what you said. It's not just 
for girls dancing on the app. There's kind of niches. It's almost like Twitter or any social media platform. You kind of find your, your niche or who you like or who you really want to follow. And then you kind of build out and grow from there. And, and I agree. I like to follow people that give sound advice. Uh, you know, definitely mm-hmm. in even mainstream media, like Wolf of Wall Street or Dan Blazarian with saying like, you know, his Ignite company and all the girls and the guns and the vacations and the yachts. It's easy to yep. definitely sell a pipe dream. Uh, not to critique any of those people, but you even see it like it's funny. I like to watch a lot of old content to, to show historically how markets perform and stuff like that. And in yep. a lot of the 90s, there was a lot of... Um, the, the like uh, multi-level marketing firms of like, you know, join my pyramid scheme, you know, I'm going to help you get rich. And normally it's a spin off of real estate or some way or the other. And then basically what you're really doing is you're paying them to, for them to live a lavish lifestyle. And you're just basically trying to promote a pyramid scheme to get more people underneath you. And you're not actually doing anything pro- productive. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. So uh, I guess, you know, the way that I kind of look at finance is I kind of look at it from a hierarchical lens of like, mm-hmm. you know, debt management. So normally, you know, high interest debt, that's something you want to take care of first. People don't normally see that as an investment. A lot of times when I'm sure you've seen this, people want to get in, they're like, I want to start investing. They get all excited about it. But it's like, you know, if you're carrying $10,000 in credit card debt at 13% or 17% or 20% or however ridiculous it can get, you know, a lot of even the best financial people say your best investment is wiping that debt out. And that's a 20% return that the market can't even give to you. And then, you know, after you wipe out bad debt, building up a little bit of an emergency fund, then going into index investing. And then once you kind of have those things down, then you could start doing fun stuff, whether it's real estate or or other things abroad. I guess, what would you be your comments on on everything that I said there? I know it was long-winded. No, that's totally right. And actually, when I break it down for clients, I call it a stair step system, and it's three different steps. And the first step is kind of this one to th- uh, one to three year time horizon. And if you have expenses coming up, like a down payment or a vacation or your emergency fund, things that you know need to be kind of the foundation of your financial plan, cash is king. It's really the truth. And that cash that you just mentioned, that's just sitting in the bank account getting zero percent what it's really doing for your overall financial plan is getting you a way better rate of return than just what you're seeing from the bank that's paying you because it's keeping you away from problems and keeping you away from that credit card, which would be charging you 20% interest rate. And it's allowing your other investments to grow. So you can continue to climb the stair step and demand more return safely on your capital. Um, And really when you're building out an investment portfolio, nobody knows what the market's going to do. You know, whether they tell you they do or not, uh, that's really there's no one out there that can make that type of prediction. So if you don't know what the market's going to do, how are you supposed to invest? And it's not just by taking a guess, but it's by finding time horizons, because if you look at the market over any one year period for the last 100 years, you're up like 67 percent of the time, basically two thirds. Exactly. I don't want to bet my retirement plan in my future on 67 percent odds, but If you extend that time horizon to five years, any time five-year time horizon over the last hundred years, I don't care if you're talking 1945 to 1950, 2015 to 2020, you're up almost 95% of the time. And if you, the longer you extend that time horizon, the better your odds of success in the market are until you get to about 15 years and you've never lost money in the market ever. I really like those odds. So when we're building that time, that that stair step system, I don't want to touch the market if you need that money in the next one to three years. That's playing with fire. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree. I always thought it was 20 years. So it's interesting now that's even 15. It's probably condensed down that any 15 year period that you've uh, basically are guaranteed to make money. Including reinvested dividends. I should uh, put that caveat in there. All right. That makes sense. Definitely. Uh, So I know any 20 year period, you've definitely made money. So I I love Mm -hmm. talking to financial planners. Uh, You know, they're normally really good people, uh, you know, people, uh, people pleasers, not people pleasers, but they're very good with people. There we go. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, But I guess, how do you break down when you're talking to a client, like take it, uh, take me through the stepwise of you're talking to me if I was a new client, because I know some clients have different needs and wants. Uh, A lot of times people are scared. I know that's a a big factor for people. Sometimes they're worried. Sometimes they're like, oh, maybe I'm too late. Or, you know, there's all these different factors and there's all these different life choices that various people make. Uh, So I guess, how do you walk them through uh, and relax them from the anxiety that money can cause or investing can cause? Well, you're right at the on the first comment that a lot of advisors are people pleasers. Um, this is a relationship business. You know, it is very math and, and money oriented, which might seem a little bit black and white, 
But at the end of the day, if you can't explain what the numbers mean and get people excited or able to take action or uh, maybe to, to not take action in some cases, uh, then, then really who are you helping? So you do need to be a really great and effective communicator. So a lot of times, and hopefully I'm no uh, exception there, that does start to shine through when you start having conversations with financial planners. Um, but when I first get uh, started with a client, um, and, you know, assuming that they already know what I do and what they can expect and some of the services, you know, we always have to kind of iron out the expectations and make sure that we're aligned there. So we're both high fiving and this is a win win engagement. But once we get past that and kind of the discovery phase, the first meeting is actually what I call the priorities meeting. And it is all about having that heart to heart and identifying what you actually want to use money as a tool and a resource to help accomplish because at the end of the day, yes, we're going to be growing big portfolios and trying to get better investment performance, save money on taxes. That's table stakes. Once we do that stuff, where do you want to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And what's really fun in the financial plan is starting to identify how do we enjoy every stage of life? So I'm not the financial planner that's going to tell you to save all of your dollars until you're too old to enjoy them. I want you to have fun today as well. And if we can identify that you're on track to retire, at, uh, your, at whatever age you deci decide, and we've checked all your blind spots, and you're on track to buy the house, send your kids to school, whatever the goals are, maybe the answer is to honestly go have more fun today. And how cool of a realization when you can do that and spend money guilt-free. A lot of times I even set up a guilt-free spending account for my clients. We kind of have the base plan of just automating the budget so they don't have to be monitoring it all the time. And then having this lump sum account that is, of course is on the first stair step, like we just talked about, that they have to deplete and they have to spend it and go have fun. And that is so encouraging and so such a fun conversation to have to encourage clients to go out and spend. Definitely. I, I know I'm an investing bug and I'm definitely guilty of the latter. You know, my girlfriend definitely faults me for being like, we can go out and enjoy life now. And, you know, she's very good at talking me down the ledge and saying like, all right, I do have enough money. You know, I am on track for retirement and hitting all my goals. It's, you know, time to spend some money and, and enjoy life while you still have it. Because exactly like you said, not only do we not know what the future entails in terms of the money markets, you don't know what the future entails with, you know, personal health or just life in general. Uh, I mean, this pandemic, if it's shown anything, it can throw surprises in many different forms. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So and and I, my, my fiance is no, uh, or she's also been a victim of the future value calculation yes. of anything you buy. So whether we're going out to eat or buying shoes, it's like, that would be $500 in 2040, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, she that's de funny. My, yeah, definitely. I, I guess our, uh, our girlfriends and fiance can relate in that regard for sure. Uh, we yep. definitely are always doing the calculations in our head with the uh, time value of money. So no doubt. I guess, what are some of the key variables that you see to drive like uh, projections for folks for their investing goals? So like, do you look at it more in, I know you're looking at more of the long-term, but exactly kind of mm -hmm. what you said. So you have a long-term bucket, do you have a medium-term bucket and then a short-term bucket? Uh, kind of like, you know, forcing them to enjoy their money, medium-term, maybe a car or a house, and then long-term is retirement. Is that kind of how you uh, factor down the buckets basically? Yeah, that is a good way to summarize it. Um, we do let the plan do a lot of the talking and we acknowledge that this is our best guess. Nobody knows what the future is going to hold, but let's make an educated decision here. So it is uh, one way that we do start is I'm yet to find a client that wants to be forced to work for the rest of their life. So um, when I start to frame it instead of like as the R word of retirement, a lot of my clients are in their 20s, 30s and 40s and retirement isn't exactly the most inspiring thing to yeah. save and invest for. But when we start thinking about work becoming optional and becoming financially independent and starting to kind of change the way that we think about the R word, because um, when I think about retirement, I just think about like my grandpa working until 65, golfing for 10 years, and you know that's life. And that's not something that we get fired up about, especially it being 20, 30, 40 years away. So, but when we start thinking about work becoming optional and, and starting to work backwards on how we can get there, that really does start shaping the budget and how much we need to be saving and investing. And I have a lot of clients who want to make work become optional in their 40s and then start working on their passion project that maybe doesn't have as much monetary value per se as income, but really is fulfilling. So how do we accomplish that? So thinking about the big picture of what your goals are and one of them potentially being making work become optional. Um, of course, we can't ignore the short-term things of uh, buying a house and all that stuff. So it is kind of a, a lot of moving parts at one time. 
And once we start being able to, to see the big picture of the financial plan, I kind of take, I, I call it looking at the 30,000 foot view yeah. and then starting to zoom in. So it's almost like the cadence of financial planning where we take a look at the big picture and then we zoom in on an individual topic and then see how that ripple effects happens 10, 15, 20 years out. We take a look at the big picture and then zoom back in on an individual topic. So we're not missing any of the topics while keeping a big picture mindset. Yeah, that's excellent. I think you're, you're leading just right into the next topic. I don't know if that was by design, but I was actually going to ask about the FIRE community or the um, Financial Independence Retire Early as the acronym is for, for my listeners. So what are your thoughts on that? So I know you bring up, obviously, you know, retiring potentially in your 40s or maybe early 50s. I know a mm -hmm. lot of the traditional investment accounts aren't maybe as conducive to allowing that to happen with, you know, 401ks or IRAs or 403bs. A lot of times they have a, an age limit of 59 and a half or, or even later, or, you know, you can advantage your distributions if you even take them even later. So that yeah. is not very conducive to someone that wants to retire in their forties or early fifties. So how would you lead someone down that path? Yeah. It, overall, I love the movement. I, I think it's really exciting. Uh, that people are kind of flipping retirement, the traditional, which is, again, why I avoid the R word, uh, upside down. And it's really fun to plan for. It, it gets me fired up as a planner to see something different and see someone so inspired to take such big action. Um, one thing that I do push back on in that community is really identifying, you know, you're working your tail off now and you're trying to go from zero to 100 as far as freedom and your time goes. And you're trying to almost like hold your breath for this 10, 15 year period until you become financially independent. And now you can start living your life. To me, I, I really do in my process when we're talking about the priorities and the goals, start to figure out, let's say you're financially independent today. What are you going to do? Yeah, sure. You'll lay on the beach for the first three months, but I promise you're going to get bored. And maybe the answer is traveling and doing all this different stuff. And that's awesome. Let's really start to vet that out. But I bet. I bet there you could start doing some of that stuff today and start enjoying life now. So how do we kind of create this like beautiful uh, uh, combination of this fire later, but also enjoying some of the aspects that fire would allow you to do today. And that's really where I kind of push back on the fire community is trying to identify how do we have fun today instead of just holding your breath until this magical moment of just sitting on the couch or traveling or doing whatever you want 24 um, seven. But all in all, I think saving a, a large portion of your income for flexibility is really, really cool. I'm, I, I don't hear a whole lot of people regretting that they've attempted to retire early and then looking at their pile of savings and, and not sure what to do with it. Cause usually we can find a place for it. And, and it's a fun conversation to have. Definitely. And it's funny you should say that. I think everyone, I don't want to call it like the lottery mentality, but I almost feel like, yeah, I even listen to obviously a lot of billionaires or people that are very successful and do exactly what you said. You know, they sell a company, they do an exit strategy for a startup, uh, they were step down as CEO and do exactly what mm -hmm. you said. They, you know, drink their, you know, they go nuts, go drinking on every island in the world, or, you know, they travel from beach to beach and they live there. And exactly what you said, even the ones that really enjoy that, they say they do it for six months, a year max, and then that life gets very old very quick. And then either whether they start a new venture or they get back into the game, uh, that seems to just be a common theme, at least for the people that are very, I, get, I, I don't want to downplay anyone else's work, but just say over high achievers or people that just retire early. And then they're like, okay, if I got another 40 years to live, well, you know, I got to find another hobby or I got to do something else. Otherwise this life gets old very quick. I find that counseling happening with my retirees all the time. They are so excited to retire and then they do. And they're calling me a month later, bored and not sure what to do. And they're going back to work and, and like doing something that they enjoy, which is awesome. But to kind of be thinking that you're gonna uh, be working your tail off and then just having zero income or zero activities planned, I think is probably um, a little bit inaccurate, to be honest. So creating those plans where it's almost like this fun transition is more is probably more accurate than just having this working really hard and then cold turkey never working again. Usually there's there's some middle ground there. Yeah, and I completely agree. I know, I know my parents are getting to the retirement age. And, uh, you know, I definitely worry. I mean, being, you know, the son of them, I, I worry that they don't have enough to fill their plates for when they do retire from their nine to fives. It's like they're going out into uh, retirement with not, you know, filling 40 hours is very tough to do. You, people don't realize it because obviously their day jobs normally take up 
the majority of that, if not more time usually. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I, I really hope that they can get enough activities, whether it's volunteering, whether maybe even get a part-time job after a year or two years, or not saying that they have to work, but, you know, just do something to uh, yeah. take up their time instead of just, like you said, sitting on a couch or sitting on a beach can get old very quick. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it is definitely really interesting to see the, the transition of my retirees uh, going through that process and having those conversations. So that's a ton of fun, which we should probably caveat that if you are in that position and you're worried about what you're going to do with your time, how blessed you already are yeah. um, to, to be in that position. But it's real. That is definitely a part of financial planning that not a lot of people talk about and even in retirement. Yeah, definitely. I, I think you're, you're in a, you know, count your blessings. If you're in that situation, you're luckier than okay. a lot of people or at least 50% of the population, I'd say in the United States. Uh, so that that's a good position to be in. So I guess, is there any common themes between qu- clients in terms of like aha moments or like, you know, may, whether it's fear or worry or doubt or whatever it may be where you've kind of seen uh, you've unlocked them and be like, Oh, okay. Like this isn't that bad. Or, you know, like they almost, you kind of bridge the gap between the now and the future and give them better hindsight on on what's to come basically. Yeah. I think there's a lot of times a a misconnect with um, maybe using your portfolio as a, an income machine. So a lot of people think, and I have a lot of clients, especially younger clients who want to create passive income. And it's almost becoming kind of like a buzzword. And that's a buzzword we could find all over the place on TikTok of how to Airbnb, blah, 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 and create this passive income. But not very many people think about using their portfolio as a passive income machine. And there's been a ton of research on this of like, you know, the quote unquote 4% safe withdrawal rule and being able to use your investment portfolio to create that income stream. And I think that's probably one of the most common misconceptions I see about saving into the 401k because people just think if I need $50,000 a year and for easy numbers, I need it for 10 years, I must need 500,000, just 50,000 times 10. And it's like, you're kind of wrong on a lot of different fronts because not only are you gonna need 50,000, but then inflation will go up but you're not going to just be sitting that money in cash. It's going to be growing as it's sitting there over that 10 year period. So how does, you know, how do we kind of find the middle ground there? And that is a lot of fun working with clients who maybe came to me originally trying to buy investment portfolio or investment properties, just thinking they were going to become a property manager. And that's really what the dream of, you know, retiring early is. And actually maybe they can do it a little bit quicker with less risk and maybe in a more tax advantageous way, and maybe doing it with less effort and less work than trying uh, through their 401k, IRAs, brokerage accounts, et cetera, than uh, the passive income, which I'm I'm happy to double click on some of that stuff because uh, what what actually owning those investment properties really means to your portfolio and to your level of risk that not a lot of people think about. Yeah, and it definitely, uh, I think a lot of people, common misconceptions, and I completely agree with your sentiment about TikTok, everyone's selling the pipe dream, but you know, when you're buying these properties, you know, there's a lot more work that goes into it, you know, whether it's legal fees, whether it's light, writing a lease, whether it's getting a property manager that you have to pay for, we're getting landscaping, oh, something breaks, you know, now this $200 a month income that you're expecting now has to go into fixing the toilets. So now you're down for a few months. So there's definitely risk that comes with it. I, I know a lot of times that people, if, you know, I have a thousand apartments and condominiums and all this, but it's like, but you're not looking at the other side of their balance sheet that they have a lot of outstanding debt. And God forbid another uh, COVID crisis occurs or something like that, where you have tenants Mm -hmm. not paying, you have things breaking, you have people not being able to enter homes because of COVID or whatever reason it can be. Uh, There is a lot of risk that comes with that. And, you know, you hope that a lot of people that did get into buying houses and stuff didn't just start in the tail end of 2019, because I think they were in for a rude awakening uh, if they had a bunch of clients or tenants not paying their rent for for whatever reason. Um, So, yeah. And I think when you become a property manager and that's the route that you want to take to create passive income and and become financially independent through real estate or whatever the case or selling court whatever you want to do what's called a spade a spade because if you want to be able to actually travel and uh, be completely financially independent so that you your your work like the level of input that you put you make into this business does not reflect the outcome meaning that you could just travel the world and take instagram pictures all day long and that's your retirement life and you're going to use properties to do it Basically, what you're telling us then is that you want to own a property management company and you are going to be the owner of this small business. 
and your your small business is run by you, the CEO. And you know how how great are you at, at doing this? What's your uh, pedigree in real estate? Number one, number two, you're probably within one country, probably within one state, and probably within one city if you bought a bunch of duplexes right next to each other. So people are like, oh, I want to be so diversified. I'm going to buy real estate. Are you really diversified or did you kind of just take the most concentrated position you possibly could and you're one house fire, you're one squatter, meaning someone that just doesn't pay rent and doesn't leave. And by the way, can't get evicted under COVID law. Uh, and if you're in California, they probably can just stay there forever. It seems like it, or like the landlord laws. Um, there's so much risk involved in that. And people say like, oh, the market's so risky. And it's like, well, maybe it, it is, but the market, you're holding thousands of companies from around the world who are run by the greatest CEOs in the world. So when Jeff Bezos wakes up every morning to get himself richer and you own Amazon and your index funds, you're technically benefiting from that. Jeff Bezos works for you. So yeah. does Mark Zuckerberg. So does Tim Cook. So does every great CEO uh, across the, the globe. I love that when I own thousands of companies run by the greatest CEOs and I literally don't have to do anything. Now people assess risk with volatility and I think that's kind of incorrect. It's not like there's a, you know, a ticker going across your garage door every single morning telling you what the value of your home is. And if there was, I think people would associate real estate with the stock market a lot closer and probably wouldn't claim that real estate only goes up. Um, yeah. Because, you know, 2008 or even in, in March of last year, when the market was down 30 percent, your home value could have been down a significant percentage, but you don't know it. Yeah. So there's really, you know, you're not trying to buy or sell. You know, grandma bought her house in 1945 for 50,000 and then sold it in 2010 uh, for call it 500,000. And you're like, wow, real estate's a great investment. It's like, yeah, but if grandma would have put that 50,000 into the S&P 500, she'd probably have like 6x that. Yeah. Nobody thinks like that. They just see the only two times that they ever sold a property and it went up. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I, I love that you tied in the Warren Buffett uh, aspect of it, because that's definitely a quote that he said. If someone went outside your house every day and yelled at you, the price of your house changed in value. And if it was down 10, 15, 20 percent, you wouldn't immediately sell it. You just keep living there. And, you know, through time, eventually you should recoup your costs. Uh, I know a lot of people don't don't know this, but obviously with a, a 1031, which is a spe specific tax tax form in order to take mm -hmm. a rental property and convert it into a more expensive rental property. Most people, when they're thinking of properties, it's properties they own. And I know I live, I reside in New Jersey. Specifically, I know when you're selling your house, if you don't buy another one in New Jersey, let's just say you want to leave New Jersey and go to another state, there's a, it's not an exit tax, but there's basically an exit tax. So even though you've held the property for so many years, you know, let's just say you bought a house at $250,000 in New Jersey 25 years ago, and that's appreciated mm -hmm. to 500,000, let's just say. So it's doubled in price. But what you don't realize with the double in price is not only do you get hit with an exit tax, you're also taxed on long-term capital gains. And this is not something I need to tell you. You can obviously depreciate it down with if you've done a roof or if you've done solar panels, or if you've done any improvements, you can weigh it down. But at the end of the day, you know, the state or the federal government is still getting a cut of the real estate that you have, unless you're linking really like a, a rental property. But then even then with the rental property, you've got to pay for lawyers, you got to pay for a management company. If a squatter's there, you have to take the hit on that, whatever it may be. So uh, there is a lot of risk in real estate where with the stock market, exactly like you said, you're kind of getting the benefit of the top 500, top 1000, top 2000 CEOs globally or in the United States or wherever, whatever jurisdiction you're investing into. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't have said it any better. Couldn't agree anymore. So uh, I guess, so now we've talked a lot about index investing, but I guess kind of going pivoting off of that. So what are your thoughts on maybe some alternative investments? So not that we've ragged on real estate a lot, that that is an upside that you can do, but what about specifically, I'm talking about Bitcoin as a hedge against, uh, you know, potentially volatile markets or, you know, not say that a collapse the US dollar, but you know, just as well as me that the Federal Reserve in the last, you know, 19 months has printed about 40% of the supply of US dollars. So not only have we seen price appreciation in stocks, we've also seen it in real estate, we've seen it in Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. What are your thoughts or even uh, I know I got really big into uh, Pokemon card investing and baseball cards or football cards. It's not mm -hmm. all of my portfolio, but it's just something fun that I do on the side. I've actually done well. I've lost some 
um, on other things. So it's like anything, yeah. if you were to pick stocks and the company weren't to do well versus an index fund, I guess, where do you leave your clients with room to do more speculative assets or uh, just more fun things? You know, it's like, Colin, I'm only doing index fund investing for hundred percent of my portfolio on board. Can, can you give me something to invest with fun stuff, whatever it may be? Yes. Uh, back to our original conversation of the three stair steps. You have your cash, you have your intermediate account, maybe it's more like bonds or fixed income or something like that. And then we have our stock portfolio on the third stair step. There is the fourth stair step. All right. Good to know. And this one, and this one does not have a time horizon. It does not have a uh, percentage of expected returns. And we are not going to include it in your wealth building plan. So if you are going to put this portfolio into individual stocks, Bitcoin, you gold, name it, yeah, whatever, yeah. Gold, whatever, yep, I am not going to include it in the financial plan and your path to uh, financial freedom and, and making work become optional. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the first thing uh, that, that I want to be clear on. So um, it's not really a recommendation or, or uh, I'm not even going to really comment on it from a, um, especially for clients of whether I think it's a good investment or a bad investment. Um, I view all of these things, Bitcoin or a weed stock or any other idea that, uh, you know, electric cars, you name it, batteries that clients come up with. It's my first question with any investment decision is how is this going to impact your goals? You mentioned that you wanted to send your kid to school, you wanted to retire by 55 and you wanted to buy a house, blah, blah, blah. Is this getting you closer to those goals? And you go, well, I need to make money. If I make a bunch of money, then, uh, then it will. And that's the really difficult piece. We don't know what the future is going to hold, but we can at least look back from a probability standpoint and say, okay, if you're invested in equities, uh, you've only lost money over a 10 year period, like once or twice in the last hundred. Those are really darn good odds. Um, buying this, there's really no time horizon. So we got to put it on the fourth stair step. And I don't believe that I, I'm going to uh, endorse that as a wealth building tool. However, do I own some? Yes. I think it's interesting. Um, I have a fourth stair step. I have my gambling account is what I call it. I use this to buy individual stocks and basically remind myself how impossible it is to beat the market and how difficult it is. And someday when I'm laying on my deathbed, I'll try to do my calculation and see if I beat the market. And uh, that's not going to impact my ability to retire or send my kids to school or any of my goals, but it's just a little enjoyment that I have with myself of, of, uh, I, cause I don't gamble, I don't sports bet. And this is kind of my nod to, uh, either one of those avenues. Um, Bitcoin is so darn interesting. You know, we've never seen anything like it. And I know that there's so many, I'm sure back in the, uh, 1800s, you know, with the tulip craze in the Netherlands, if you've happened to hear about that, when, when tulips were selling, uh, and, and there's a big tulip bubble. I mean, yes, I can't imagine yep. buying a plant or a flower, but, I would imagine that they were thinking this time is different as well. And we could go on and on for the last 200 years of every uh, asset class that has had a bubble or has been revolutionary. And I think Bitcoin will be super, super interesting. I think there's a ton of reason, especially with like El Salvador saying that, hey, you can pay your freaking taxes in Bitcoin now. Like there is some serious use, use cases and being able to transfer money. Um, and I know that you're much more knowledgeable about this, setting up nodes and things like that for people. Um, there's a lot of freedom and independence to that, which I can get excited about and understand it and back it and high five a client. From a wealth building, pure management standpoint, um, it's, it's difficult for me to get excited about it as a wealth building tool for your path to financial freedom. That's kind of a long-winded answer there. <laughs> no, 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 that's good. I really appreciate that. So I guess I'll caveat this. So like, I appreciate that you said that you have Bitcoin and you were honest about that and you consider it in your fourth bucket, but obviously yep. uh, for, for anything in this fourth bucket, not just criticism looking at Bitcoin, but even sports yep. cards and other things are, yes, are you knowledgeable on the, the, the tax, uh, pro, uh, the tax issues that come with them? Cause I know specifically with Bitcoin, it's seen as property. So obviously if you, if you sell it, it's, it incurs a different uh, long-term and short-term capital gains, such as property. I know, yep. uh, I know baseball cards and stuff are very similar. It's seen as a hobby and that's taxed at a higher rate. So uh, yep. not, I guess I'm just saying it as a word of warning to not only just my listeners, but to your clients about like, you don't want to get yourself in awkward uh, tax issues year over year for selling in and out of a lot of these markets. Uh, if you can cover it, but you know, in the event you sell a bunch of stuff 
and then you put it into something risky and then it goes down and then you're basically uh, a tax call uh, April of the following year, you know, you want to be able to have the money. And I know cryptocurrency or Bitcoin in general is very volatile. So I, I really recommend, you know, buying and looking more for the long term, uh, not trying to sell in and out like trade markets. Um, so I, I guess I don't know if you had any advice on that, on, on the tax implications of those. You're, you nailed it. The, the, uh, it is going to be taxed as either a long term or short term capital gain, kind of just like any other stock. Um, the only maybe comment, and this is kind of fun, is that my gambling account is within a Roth IRA. Oh, so okay. I do buy and sell here and there uh, just for fun. Again, I do not recommend this. This is my gambling uh, account that just it's a battle between me, myself and I uh, of, of returns here and just having fun. And I do like to make some bets uh, on, on companies that I believe in. And uh, again, not for my uh, personal ability to become financially independent, but just in this play account, that's one way that you can avoid some taxes and being able to trade a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. I, I do the same thing as well. I, I was doing for a little bit of time, I was doing it more in a Robin Hood account. So that was like, mm -hmm. I guess, real gambling in the sense of just putting just random stocks and stuff like that. But I, I've yeah. kind of wised up to take advantage of Roth IRA. I was able to transfer old an, an old 401k into it and kind of basically get the uh, tax uh, protection basically by going, you know, short term bets, nothing crazy, nothing that if it went to zero, I wouldn't lose sleep over it and it wouldn't affect my retirement basically. Uh, so Which that's very Oh, sorry. I didn't mean no, to no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I'm glad that you even brought up Robin Hood just in general, because it, uh, there's been a really popular topic to talk about and that so many young people are kind of gamifying the stock market and Robin Hood could probably be to be blamed for that, you know, making it like, you know, red and green colors. So you're like in the positive, you're in the negative and making it so easy. I'm curious to hear what your take is on whether that has been a net benefit or a net negative to kind of introducing all of these new investors, because there's it's no secret that the demographic is, you know, the 18 to 30 year old who maybe didn't know what to do with their stimulus check. And now there's like, what, 20 million new brokerage accounts on Robinhood yeah, I think in the last 12 20, months? Yeah, 25 million or so, something absurd. Something crazy, exactly. So uh, I think that's a great point. Pause. And that, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, personally, I, I think it's like anything. Uh, so I guess I don't wanna give a political answer. I think it's a good thing overall, but it's like anything, mm -hmm. like social media, like you hear horror stories of people being bullied online or, you know, people that are, um, you know, feeling the stress of social pressures. I think it's very much the same thing with Robinhood. I think it's a great, like, doorway to get in and to understand. And exactly like you said, take your $1,200 uh, $1, stimulus check and kind of use it as play money if you don't absolutely need it for bills or anything. But then with that, you know, definitely leveraging, okay, this is my steps into it. How do I level up or how do I go to the next level? Taking advantage of uh, an HSA. And I'm sure that you know and love all about them. It's a triple tax leveraged account. Uh, I, I think that's even more beautiful than the Roth IRA or the uh, 401k personally. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. And you could probably talk to it as well. I know Ben and I had another episode uh, a while back talking about that and all the benefits that you can basically put money in there uh, tax-free, you can invest money and get gains tax-free, and then you can take money out tax-free if you have medical expenses that you paid out of pocket when you were growing or you know th going through life and then taking it out. Uh, I always advise people to not use it. If, if you need the money for whatever medical procedure, by no means don't say, oh, I can't do this because I can't pay out of pocket. Definitely use your HSA to your benefit if it's life or death or whatever, if you're in a tough spot. But if you can use, if you have the money on side, exactly like you said, like another cash bucket that you can pay out of pocket for, oh, I need to go get stitches. It's a thousand dollars or whatever it may be. Use the cash and then save the receipt. And then when you retire, you can take it as tax-free income, which I think is beautiful. But I'm sorry, that was a long way to response, but I think it's a great way to get into it. Uh, I actually deleted my Robinhood account because I don't like a lot of their business practices. I've now changed over to SoFi. This is, I'm not sponsored by either ones, uh, good or bad, but I know there's yeah. like interactive brokers, there's SoFi, there's Webull, there's a whole list of different companies that use them. And I definitely recommend people to look into what they like and what they see as a good fit for them. Yeah. And that's a good point too. The Robin Hood's not the only player. I mean, public is out there. You yes, know, I trying do like to public. Even socialize, you know, make, make trading and talking about money more of a social thing. That's awesome. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm really excited to see how easily accessible this stuff is becoming. And I'm a huge fan of the robo advisors, Betterment, Wealthfront. Yes, yes. I think they are doing, they're, they're kind of like the leaders in the uh, easy to access brokerage account and IRA 
uh, space. And then maybe on the other end where you have the ability to buy and sell a little bit more uh, risky stuff and it's a little bit more gamified, it's at least it's easy to access. And to your point, getting people involved and maybe they'll be able to level up and just getting excited about investing and knowing what the S&P 500 even is. Um, I mean, I wasn't even interested in that stuff and didn't learn much about it until midway through college. So yeah. uh, to get people excited about it that are not finance oriented, uh, at least uh, originally, is really cool to me. So I think it's a net benefit overall. And I'd rather have a 25 year old lose, you know, 500 bucks in the stock market uh, than, you know, maybe develop bad practices and do that sometime later in life and, and maybe try to touch the to touch the hot stove now while they're young and then learn not to do that later on. Exactly. And even doing it, something that I see is uh, I, I'll say like not less risky, but less of a bad habit. Like if they took the 500 bucks and they put it on blackjack at the casino or they totally. took a bet for the uh, jets to win or whatever it may be, you know, that's not a habit that teaches good returns. The house always wins in that. If you look at the odds where exactly like what yep. you were saying over any 20 year period, the stock market, you've more than uh, bettered your returns from what you did 20 years ago or whatever that long. Exactly. Time yep. Time. You've never lost money and exactly. nobody can say that about sitting in a casino for 20 years. Definitely. Exactly. Exactly. The house always wins. They're the only ones that have, that have won it. So uh, that's for sure. So I, I guess this is a question and this isn't like a got you question, but I've just kind of mm -hmm. uh, your, your insight in how has your investing strategy sh uh, changed over, let's just say COVID, but seeing with kind of like uh, the Federal Reserve drop us interest rates to near zero, obviously mm -hmm. we saw the boom in stock markets, but I'm saying this more in a caveat of, you know, the 60, 40 portfolio of stocks matched with bonds, uh, obviously mm -hmm. with now like, um, uh, uh, Jerome Powell coming out every quarter, every couple months and saying that inflation is, is showing 5%, where if you look at the 30-year bond being at 2.2%, you look at the 10-year treasury bond being at like 1.5, let's just say. So, so I guess, what are your thoughts to someone that might be more intrigued about the financial market saying having 40% in bonds, you're really getting hurt to inflation? Are you saying go more into equities? Or are you pushing them further out on the risk curve into a Bitcoin or into another thing? I know that's kind of your fourth bucket, but I guess, how would you allocate their portfolio based on the current economics of UC going on with interest rates near zero? That is the golden question. I think if you can figure that out, you, you've really made it as an advisor. Every advisor struggling with it is maybe a better way to phrase that. Okay. Super interesting environment that we're in that, for example, back in like 19, in the 1990, yeah. um, if you wanted to get an expected 7% rate of return, you could hold basically 90% bonds, 10% stock. Yeah. And then 10 years later, it went down and now you had to hold about 50% stock, 50% bond. In today's environment, if you want to get an expected 7% rate of return, you pretty much have to be 100% or 90% equity. Yeah. That's, and, that's scary. Especially, and it, I can say you and I are much younger, so we can be out uh, further out on the risk curve meaning that we can mm -hmm. be much more exposed to more volatile assets or assets that are seen as riskier. But I, I guess I worry for a lot of older people, you know, in their 60s plus that are getting towards mm -hmm. retirement age that, you know, if they're trying to put it in a, a fixed income or a bond that's trying to return, but then inflation's higher than that, that's a good way to get wiped out as you go to the grocery store. Prices are up 10%, 5%, whatever it may be, but your bond is only returning 2%. That's a really good way to get wiped out. And obviously I know you are trying to hedge out the risk for your clients older or not. Uh, regardless, mm -hmm. but it's just a very interesting thing. And uh, I, I'm sure you know Ray Dalio, obviously, uh, one of yep. my favorite books, I actually have it right here. Uh, that is Money Master the Game by Tony Robbins. Uh, oh, nice. in, in the book, it's one of my all time favorite books. A lot of the investing strategies it was done in 2016 don't work as well in this current environment. But uh, yeah. Ray Dalio's all weather portfolio, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, like he hedges it with various assets. So he was like 30% of stocks, uh, like 40% bonds, 7% gold. Uh, I think 5% mm -hmm. real estate and all these different assets that basically he said, if you were to gift his kids anything, it would be this portfolio that should hold up in any environment of high inflation, high deflation, high stagflation. It was basically just trying to hedge against all scenarios. And this should be yep. something that's good. But it's interesting to hear him on a lot of CNBC or CNN or, or what, Mad Money or whatever it may be. A lot of people have been very interested in Bitcoin. And he said, I'd rather own Bitcoin than a bond. And I know Ray Dalio, he started years ago, 50 years ago, he was kind of saying, uh, you know, he had bonds at, you know, near 14% or 13%. Uh, it's very hard to take 
bonds from 14% to zero, it's hard to even harder for them to go zero to negative 14. So I know he's kind of seeing it as like, exactly like you said, not being as mm-hmm. exposed to bonds because they're just kind of a bad bet in this current environment. So from a allocation standpoint and how I build models, for example, at least from an equity standpoint, yeah. um, one way that you could, th- is really to, uh, um, I'm not making any bets that uh, I know the future. Yeah. Uh, and, and so what I'm doing is really taking uh, market cap weighted and, and trying to build portfolios that way. So for example, okay. um, the United States of all the publicly traded companies in the world uh, takes up about 57, 58% of mm-hmm. that. So yep. that would be um, the, about the 4,000 publicly traded companies in the United States. Yep. Um, so you can guess then about 56, 58% of my allocation is gonna be in US. And then the 6% that goes to Japan and the, the amount that goes to Germany and the UK and uh, Australia and Canada and Mexico, like the go, list goes on. And that's really how I'm building the portfolios to be globally diversified and and very much uh, low cost via index funds. So, you know, when, when we're building them out, that's really what we're thinking about. And when you introduce something like Bitcoin and you start thinking, well, how do I hold that uh, in proportion to the overall uh, market cap? Um, I think there could be a really good argument to be made. And I've, I do have clients that own Bitcoin kind of in this type of strategy to think, what is the market cap? of Bitcoin and, you know, what, how should your portfolio reflect that? And, you know, in today's environment, it'd probably be like maybe point, you know, two, 5% of your portfolio, Um, but it exists and it's probably growing a little bit. Uh, So that's, that's really how I am building out equity portfolios and kind of a, a global environment here and really trying to, to your point, uh, create that all weather portfolio that is just going to keep on keeping on. So I am not making changes based on, you know, Trump's tweets or Biden's tax laws or, you know, anything that's going on in the news or China doing this. Uh, we're, we're really uh, setting it and rebalancing it and really focusing on the things that we can control. What is your income? What are your expenses? How do we reduce your taxes? How do we actually live a great life? That's really where we're focusing most of our time on. But getting back to the point earlier, it is a very difficult environment for retirees where you can't really get that. That second stair step, what I've been talking about, is almost non-existent. You're starting to get into this cash or all equity, one or the other kind of a polar type portfolio. And any bonds that you hold, um, I've heard other advisors call them just kind of a, uh, a softening of the portfolio, just so that you're not and 100% stock with a goal of just maintaining uh, inflation, which is a really tough place to be. Yeah, and I think that's perfect. Uh, I I like what you said about rebalancing. I know probably in the tail end of last year, I was way too overexposed to US. Uh, Not not saying US is a bad market, but I was like 60% US and then like Mm -hmm. 60 or 70%, maybe even higher. Yeah, it's probably like 70% US and I was Mm -hmm. only about 30% uh, rest of the world. Uh, and yep. I really balanced that down. Definitely, I brought it probably closer to 40 or 50% and then kind of took uh, broader equities elsewhere as well, emerging markets and developed markets to try and balance myself and hedge. Like I just definitely saw that the US market was overvalued and not saying I'm trying to time the market ever. That's not a strategy I recommend. Uh, it's actually one of the mistakes that I talked about that worked in my favor, but it's, it, it was like, I, I, I'll tell the story really quickly. Basically, in I was using Robinhood in January of 2020 Mm-hmm. You know, setting stop losses 4% below, obviously, uh, the tops of what they had run up. So they had run up, you know, 50%, 30%, whatever they'd run up. I was setting stop limits, limits 4% below. In January or early February, my whole portfolio got liquidated. So it was just like, it was my gambling, my bucket four. So I watched as my whole Robin Hood portfolio turns red and liquidates immediately. And I was wow. just sat in cash and I'm like, okay, Chris, what's going on? Like literally every stock that I had in there, I had Tesla, I had, you know, what you, any stock, you name it, Amazon. Alibaba, you know, sing, whatever, you know, uh, I had a little bit of Berkshire Hathaway, all of my stocks got liquidated. So I'm like, something big's going on. And I heard a little bit about coronavirus. I was, I thought people was like, oh, we're overreacting. It's not gonna be that big of a deal. Obviously I saw the whole March event happened. And basically I, I pulled, I don't want to say, I, I can't even compare myself to Warren Buffett, but basically, you know, when Warren Buffett says, when everyone's freaking out, you know, if Kohl's had, or Amazon had 30% off the store wide, 
why does everyone freak out? I kind of took his advice to heart. I saw everything was down 30%, whatever it was that it liquidated down in March. I started putting half of it or a quarter of it in April. And then by June 1st, I was back fully in my positions and I kind of have wrote it up ever since. So uh, I'm not calling myself a genius. I'm not calling myself that I planned it. I don't recommend people do that for their investing accounts. I did it for just my fun money. Yeah. If it went to zero, I'd be fine. Uh, but yeah, it was a valuable lesson that I won't do again, but definitely re with rebalancing and looking as if something goes up a lot, you know, what's it most likely going to do? It's going to come down. Maybe it's time to rebalance or put yourself in other equities that might be able to do better in a different environment. I'll give uh, one little pro tip here and the maybe only place that market timing does exist for someone who does not believe in market timing is Roth conversions. So if you okay. are already holding money in pre-tax and post-tax accounts, and let's say they're both a 90-10 portfolio or, or whatever portfolio, they're yeah. identical portfolios. Mm -hmm. And they're both just growing wealth. They have the exact same goal. Uh, when the market was down, I did move a bunch of pre-tax into post-tax dollars. Oh man! And that balance was 30% lower than what I would have normally paid tax on. And uh, that one worked out okay. So you used like a, a backdoor Roth conversion or a not maybe not a super mega backdoor conversion, but a backdoor conversion into the Roth. That makes sense. That, uh, that's exactly. really good. And I know a lot of uh, wealth managers, that's kind of when you got your, your, your pill, uh, you got paid in the sense that uh, I bet your clients are calling, freaking out. What are we doing? Do we liquidate the whole thing? And you're like, calm down. This is a great time to buy. And I always find it managing other people's money. Not that I've done it professionally myself, but hearing from hedge fund managers or wealth managers or people like Warren Buffett, mm -hmm. you know, it's when everyone's screaming, calling you that they want their money now is when they really actually need more money to buy things at a discount. You know, it when yeah. everything's going up, everyone's happy. And it's like, but you're buying things at a more expensive than what they should be. Um, so yeah. I, I just always find that funny. I fortunately set expectations with my stair steps very, very clearly so that when the market's down, I get very few phone calls based uh, asking what's going on or I need the money because we know that is a 10 year plus money. And anytime I ask a client, if you had to make a guess in 10 years from now, you think the market's going to be higher or lower than where it is right now? Yeah. Yeah, Colin, you're right. It's probably going to be higher. So, okay. When do you need the money? Do you need it in five years? No. Do you need it in even 10 years? Probably not. Okay. So do you think our decision to keep it right where it's at is probably okay? Yep. Awesome. Yeah, that, I think that's a great point. So I'll ask one last thing and then we'll do a wrap up. So I guess for your clients that were more retirement, so you, me, and your clients in their 30s, 40s, I'd say even 50s, when this whole liquidity crisis happened in early March of 2020, uh, obviously they can, they can bear the brunt of the volatility or the down and they kind of see it as an opportunity to buy. So some of your clients that maybe are closer to retirement or in retirement, 60 and plus, 65 plus, whatever it may be, how yeah. do you, uh, I guess they might, they might've been the ones calling you uh, obviously, we re rebounded relatively quickly, but you know, in God forbid, it was more of a 2008 crisis or a dot com bubble where it took a better part of eight to 10 years to return that. And they're like, Colin, I'm retired now. Like, wh what was your advice or, or how did you guide them through the panic of everything that happened? Well, fortunately, we've already talked about how they're allocated via their financial plan and when they're going to need the money far before this has occurred. So, when I'm making investment decisions, we're thinking about the long-term here. Um, and, and when do you actually need the dollars? So fortunately, when this these type of events occur, we're not really making um, a whole lot of changes. But to figure out how to implement it in the first place is, is really based on, on needs. So um, you know, if you're getting ready to be withdrawing 50,000 from your portfolio every single year, um, you better believe that we have a year or two sitting in cash. And that's really where we can start deploying some of that cash and starting to reduce that emergency fund or that, uh, or, or that second stair step that we have set up. So um, fortunately, when we come with a, a recommendation on the allocation, we're expecting that you're on the, uh, you know, you're, you're on the cusp of another 2008 or a, another uh, 2000, and that's going to be okay. Your plan can weather that storm. Um, and quite frankly, if you can't make it through one of those uh, type of events, you're probably not ready to retire. Um, yeah. and, and that's an honest conversation that I'm having with clients. So they know that going into it. All right, Colin, thank you so much. I'll ask you some quick wrap up questions here and then I'll let you get out of here. So thanks so much for coming on before we begin the wrap up though. Of course, um, happy to be here.
Yeah. So I guess what's been your biggest investing mistake? And I, I could, I'll caveat that since you kind of run your own business, what's your biggest investing mistake personally? And then also I kind of want to know what's your biggest business mistake? Yeah. Good question. Um, I've been pretty lucky on the investment uh, standpoint. Uh, I, I really do practice what I preach. I think uh, maybe getting into it was one of the first mistakes I made. I thought I was going to become a financial wizard, just buying and selling stocks. And this is easy. And I started like just watching and listening to people that are screaming on CNBC and uh, like, like uh, Jim Cramer and just, you know, kind of half-assing it, to be honest. Like he'd make, you know, I'd watch the show one day and then not watch it for a week. So I'm randomly making decisions based on what he's talking about. And I lost, I, I put all my lawn mowing money in college uh, into a, a, a day trading account and lost it so quickly and was absolutely devastated. In, in one way, it almost kind of uh, got me even more interested in financial planning and how to do this professionally and realizing how freaking difficult it is. So that's probably compares, compared to maybe kids putting money in their Robinhood account and getting burned. I got burned pretty good and it did not feel great. It was like basically all my money at the time. So that's probably my first lesson. I don't even know if I regret it because I did learn so much from that. Um, that's, that's number one. And I'm, I'm glad it happened. As far as business goes, it's kind of tough to say. It's, uh, you know, I really don't regret anything getting into this business. One thing I will say is that there's so many uh, people that call themselves a financial advisor. You can get your license, life insurance license in about six weeks and then start calling yourself a financial advisor. So one of the first jobs I had was much more of a sales license or a sales job. And uh, I was just calling people, trying to sell them, you know, loaded uh, mutual funds and high expense ratio funds that I received commissions on. Um, today, I no longer sell any products. I'm, I'm paid 100% based on my flat fees that I charge like a consultant. So I have zero interest or internal value in recommending you to Vanguard versus Fidelity versus any platform. Yeah, BlackRock or whatever it may be. Any platform. My fee is flat. And I'll just even say it's $4,800 for couples. I charge 4,800 bucks and you're going to get awesome financial advice. And I'm going to be holding your hand every step of the way. And I don't care if you move money to me, I do manage assets, but the fee is the exact same. Yeah. Or if it's in your best interest to keep it at the 401k, awesome, just do that. And I'm yeah, gonna and help you manage the money there. Yeah, exactly. And even with the Zoom world, I mean, you, you they can hold it themselves. You can hop on a Zoom call, be like, you know, I don't wanna see your login. You look at it and be like, okay, this is what we're gonna do. And you can manage it that way. I mean, it's awesome, the technology that we have at our hands. So I think the mistake would be at the beginning of my career, I thought it was, it is, I started out in a sales role selling products and it's taken me a long time to realize that anyone can go out and get products. What they really need is advice and someone to listen to them and someone to help them navigate where they want to be with what products they need and not really try to be the broker of those products. So um, I'm very bullish in the future for financial advice. I'm very bearish for all of these broker dealers who continue to make proprietary products that are high expense ratioed uh, and uh, excited to see this, this new wave of financial planning and millennials going out there and using robo advisors. I love robo advisors. I recommend them all the time. I actually have a partnership with Betterment, for example, um, but I think Wealthfront and, and a lot of the other platforms are fantastic as well. Yeah. And I think that's a great point. I know that's something that I hammer home a lot of times. Like, uh, not to nag on any one fund or anything, but when they have expense ratios close to 0.75, 1%, 2%, it's ridiculous. I know I Crash. we have a chart that I posted just showing 0.5, 1%, and 1.5. And the amount of money of difference, if you're investing continuously, I think we even used a base salary uh, or a base investment of $10,000, assuming you're putting, you know, um, or we, we were even doing, no, it's $5,000 for a person with $50,000 salary, $5,000 investment. So 10% of your money going into a 401k yep. and just compounding that over 30 years and 40 years and 50 years, it's 200, 300, 400, half a million dollars that's wasted in just fees that if you just did an index fund of the same amount of a Vanguard or a BlackRock or Fidelity at 0.04% or 0.02% versus the 0.5, 1%, 2%, 
0.75 or, or 1%, and you're making out so much better. And, and I think you're a testament to that. I, I see it as very uh, predatory. And, and that's part of the reason that I went into this. Uh, you know, I, exactly like you said, I, I am not fee-based. I'm not a financial planner. I'm not a CFA. I'm not any of those things. But uh, it, I, I, for a point, I did think about going into uh, selling of like financial assets and stuff. And I was like, I wouldn't adv advise this for my parents or my siblings or myself. I can't in good faith sell this to anyone else. So I really appreciate CFPs uh, and who are people that are fiduciaries to their clients that they're not going to put something that, you know, ends up paying their pockets at the end of the day, but that would not be a great investment for, for anyone else. Yeah. And, and even one more shot fired uh, towards probably 90% of my profession, if you can even call it that, because uh, a lot of times it really is just a sales industry it's trying to become a profession. I think the advice people are professionals. Um, a lot of advisors just charge 1% of assets that they manage, and that's their AUM fee. And they just put you in index funds that you could go out and pick yourself. Um, I think that's going to be really the next wave of advisors to, uh, to disappear. Yeah. And I, I mean, I do this for free. I mean, yeah, I, I have, you know, a sponsorship who I love, but, and I've helped sell Bitcoin nodes to people and I've tried to bring services, but even I will hop on a zoom call with anyone. And I will always caveat, I'm not a financial advisor. I would push them your way, or I had Jim Kreider on if they want really more in-depth information. But if they're like, mm -hmm. Hey, I have this 401k, like, what, what do I look at? What can I do? I, I will do that for free. I don't want to take any money. I don't want to hurt myself in any way, but even just kind of not even picking it for them. I'll let them pick it themselves, but just showing like, this is an expense ratio of 0.75 or 1%. This is the Vanguard or Fidelity or BlackRock or whatever. I, like I'm, I'm unbiased. It's like, if this yep. expense ratio is 0.04 or 0.02, that's a much better investment in the long term over the same thing that that's more risky. And, you know, you're just basically padding the, the manager's pockets. Um, completely agree chris yeah I, I think that's why we match up so well and i was so happy to find someone that's like true and honest their words so i guess going into one of the second last question what's your favorite book podcast youtube channel website or spot that you'd like to go for investing advice uh you can give me one of each you can give me just one spot that you go to for all your information or a good resource. sure yeah yeah so um i would say my favorite book that i've read this year is probably uh the psychology of money by morgan housel um Man, that book really just had me thinking, and he just puts uh, savings and investing in such great, easy to understand ways. And I think that I'm starting as I, because when I first got into this business, I really wanted to wow people with what I knew. Mm -hmm. And now I rarely even talk about like that stuff. I really just want to understand how do we actually implement and change behavior? Because yeah. again, I kind of at the beginning of our call with, with uh, advisors being kind of charismatic people, uh, if you know, if you can't initiate change, then really what good are you doing? Mm -hmm. So I think the behavioral side of, of financial planning is so important and so yes. overlooked um, that everyone just wants to know how do you save money in taxes? And it's like, great, even if you did that, what are you going to do with all this efficiency? Um, because that could be blown away with just an easy mistake uh, or a, a bad behavioral decision. So that's probably uh, behavioral finance and behavioral therapy, couples therapy. How do you talk about money with your spouse? that's becoming much, much more important to me and kind of the area that I'm even getting more focused on um, and also financial life planning. So uh, uh, George Kinder has actually created a certification called financial life planning. Mm -hmm. um, so I have not taken the certification, but I've read all of his books and I ask a lot of the questions that he asks uh, and, and encourages advisors to ask their clients about, you know, what, you know, if you were to be gone tomorrow, you know, what, what did you miss out on? Yeah. What did you regret that you didn't get to do? And just really diving into just stressing that money as a tool to live your beautiful life and focusing on what you're actually trying to accomplish outside of just growing large portfolios and returns, because it's so easy to get into the weeds with that and forget what this is all about. Um, so I guess I would recommend uh, psychology of money and, uh, and behavioral finance stuff. He had, uh, Morgan Housel has a blog. Uh, as well. So that's a lot of the reading that I do. Um, big fan of the, the Ritholtz Wealth Management crew. You've probably heard of Josh yes. Brown and some of those guys. Um, fans of them have met most of them in person and uh, shot the shit there. So they're they're great crew uh, and, and very knowledgeable, very real and relatable. So love those guys. Um, those are probably some of the big uh, areas that I navigate towards. 
Definitely. That's awesome. Thank you once again, for Col uh, Colin, for coming on. I'll give you the stage now if you want to pitch where someone could find you, whether Twitter, TikTok, where uh, your business account. Uh, so you can go ahead now. Sure. Yeah. So you can find me at advisewealth.com. And I got very fancy with advise. It's spelled with a Z. So A-D-V-I-Z-E wealth.com. And follow me on any social media. That's just Colin Overway. Uh, and uh, happy to talk shop anytime. Definitely. I'll definitely put all the links in the show notes on YouTube and Spotify so they can find them there if they, they don't know how to do it uh, auditorially. Uh, so Colin, thank you once again for coming on. It was a pleasure having you on. As always, everyone, you can go to the amateurinvestors.squarespace.com, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, you name it. We're at all those spots. So pleasure talking to you guys and we'll catch you on the next week's episode. Have a good one, everyone.